Good morning and welcome to this pre-recorded service from Church of the Palms. It's a pre-recorded service for Sunday, July 26th. Wherever you are coming from, we're glad you're here. And we thank you for inviting us into your home. We invite you to visit our website where you can find the bulletin for today's service and so that you can follow along and sing and worship with us. We hope that you can also use this time to create a space in which you can bring your full attention to God. This might mean putting your phone away, it might mean lighting a candle, or perhaps simply breathing deeply for a few moments to prepare. It is our prayer for you that you might feel God's presence and be at peace as we enter worship. And that in doing so, you might be able to worship God with all of your mind, all of your heart, and all of your spirit. Let us prepare to worship God.
I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and heard my cry. The Lord drew me up from the desolate pit out of the miry bog, making my steps secure, setting my feet upon a rock. He will put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. Let us worship God. Christ himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that he might die and allow us to live for righteousness. Often our lives may not reflect his intentions and we fall short. So let us acknowledge our failures and go to the Lord with penitence and confession. We are reluctant to face your judgment, all-knowing God. We know we have not fully invested the talents you've entrusted to us. We hide them and hoard them, retreating into a false sense of security. We live in the nighttime of self-protection rather than the light of full participation in loving, faithful service. We seek to escape your wrath by shrinking from life rather than investing ourselves in the task to which you call us. Have mercy on us, O God. We want to be children of the day, your day. Help us in Jesus' name, 
Amen. Our God fulfills his promise and is true to his word. We have confessed our sins. God has forgiven us because Christ died for us. So friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. As Christians over the centuries have done, let us affirm our faith by sharing the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell, the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you as you pass the peace in the sanctuary of your home. While you're doing that, we want to present some of our people behind the scenes who do so much to make this service meaningful. Peace be with you. 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 in Sarasota, Florida for our pre-recorded worship service here at Church of the Palms. Every once in a while, it's nice to peek into your world, whether it's your Pentecost outfit or your 4th of July celebration, but this time we would love to see your pets. So in the moment of sharing the piece, send us a lot of pictures or videos of your favorite furry animals, and we're going to feature them. It's their chance to be famous. Send your photo or video to jgomez at churchofthepalms.org. Um, in case you've missed it last week, we announced that we're, uh, our reopening task force committee has decided to move the reopening date from August 9th to September 20th. Your safety comes first, and as we see the numbers continuing to be very high, we're not comfortable with the date that's coming up so soon. So we will see you hopefully on September 20th, and we will continue to record our services with your faces in mind as we look into the sanctuary. In the meantime, though, we are having a drive-through event on August 30th, our fall kickoff event. We will have goodies and books, live music, a puzzle swapping table, and everything will happen from the safety of your car, and we will start our new year that will feature the fruits of the spirit. More details on that soon. Um, Meditating with scriptures is a way to invite God to speak 
directly to you. Have you ever wondered how to let scripture read you? Join Pastor Lori and spiritual director Anita Lustria for a Zoom class to learn about and to practice Lectio Divina, which is an ancient way of listening to scripture. We're excited to share this wonderful tool of meditation and as a treat, they'll also explore Visio Divina. Register on our website for this class that will be on Tuesday, August 11th from 9 to 10.15. And as a reminder, uh, next week is Communion Sunday, so be sure to tune in prepared with your bread and your cup of wine or of juice as you worship with us. You know, God is calling us into a season of being creative. And if you want to hear an incredible success story, I invite you to pay attention to the wonderful report that you're about to hear from Marlene Petro and Marcia Barson. We cannot Thank, thank this team enough for putting together our very first COVID-19 Day of Hope drive through event. And a huge success it was. Let us welcome these two wonderful women. Thanks, Genevieve. Good morning. My name is Marlene Petro. And I'm Marsha Barson. Leaning on the expert advice from Dottie and Bill Tile, Marcia and I partnered this year to oversee our ninth annual Day of Hope here at Church of the Palms. A week ago Saturday, 250 children and their families were invited to join us, masked and in the middle of a pandemic. One parent told me that having her children home had been a disaster. I imagine she speaks for many. These past five months have left many in dire straits. So Day of Hope was a light in the forest for many of them. Although the buzz and the excitement of past years were missing from this year's drive through event, the smiles and the gratitude of the children and parents were not. And these were all made possible thanks to the contributions of so many of you here in this congregation. These children from Wilkinson, Philippi Creek, and Southside will start school well equipped. Additionally, because of your generosity, we'll be able to respond to requests from these schools during the year. Thank you for loving God and loving neighbor. An event like Day of Hope can only happen with the help of many people, and it can only be the success that it was with the prayers of many more. We are so grateful to everyone who came on Saturday to enjoy the time of being together in fellowship and working together on the parking lot and safety team, the registration and gift card team, the greeters, the book team, the Boy Scouts who loaded bags of food, our amazing youth who loaded backpacks and care bags, and our photographers, Kathy Lloyd and Jerry Haley. There were many more helping hands working behind the scenes in preparation for our Day of Hope. Special thanks for the work on the dental and hygiene bags, to those who sewed face masks for both kids and adults, to our choir members for packing the All Foods food bags, and to the group that bagged the produce from Detweiler's. We are always thankful for our wonderful pastors and amazing church staff, and for the extra help from Pam Gillespie, Kathy Robinette, James Thompson, Rick Dolenga, and the entire custodial staff. Our heartfelt thanks to many others who really wished to participate this year, but with good reason simply could not. Our hearts were joined together in prayers for our families and for the children and for all our volunteers. God heard our prayers and blessed us with a spectacular day. We are truly thankful to all of you.
Singapore, a poem by Mary Oliver. In Singapore, in the airport, a darkness was ripped from my eyes. In the women's restroom, one compartment stood open. A woman knelt there, washing something in the white bowl. Disgust argued in my stomach, and I felt in my pocket for my ticket. A poem should always have birds in it, kingfishers say with their bold eyes and gaudy wings. Rivers are pleasant, and of course trees. A waterfall, or if that's not possible, a, a fountain rising and falling. A person wants to stand in a happy place in a poem. When the woman turned, I could not answer her face. Her beauty and her embarrassment struggled together and neither could win. She smiled and I smiled. What kind of nonsense is this? Everybody needs a job. Yes, a person wants to stand in a happy place in a poem, but first we must watch her as she stares down at her labor, which is dull enough. She is washing the tops of the airport ashtrays as big as hubcaps with a blue rag. Her small hands turn the metal, scrubbing and rinsing. She does not work slowly nor quickly like a river. Her dark hair is like the wing of a bird. I don't doubt for a moment that she loves her life and I want her to rise up from the crust and the slop and fly down to the river. This probably won't happen, but maybe it will. If the world were only pain and logic, who would want it? Of course it isn't. Neither do I mean anything miraculous, but only the light that can shine out of a life. I mean the way she unfolded and refolded the blue cloth, the way her smile was only for my sake. I mean the way this poem is filled with trees and birds. Compassionate and faithful God, there is nowhere where you are not, not in space or time, not in prayers answered or those unanswered. You are in it all. And yet we confess that we come to you today afraid and weary, afraid that there are places where you are not, afraid of this virus, for our health and for the health of those we love, afraid of financial insecurity and of uncertainty, and we're tired, tired of the isolation, tired of the news and the division and of the constant reminders of our lack of control. We confess and ask for your forgiveness for picking up what we have all too often already laid at your feet. We confess that we deny your presence and your power when we succumb to our fear. Forgive us. Here it is, Lord, our pain, our anxiety, our depression, and our fear. We surrender them all to you. And we give thanks for your steadfast love. It extends to the heavens, your faithfulness to the clouds. All the people may take refuge in the shadow of your wings. We pray today for doctors and nurses and scientists working to fight this virus. Give them strength. We pray for those who cannot afford to stay home and for teachers and students and parents as they face difficult decisions and unfamiliar paths. We pray for those suffering and dying and for those who love them. Give them peace. Let them see and feel the certainty that your love waits for them beyond this life, for you are in it all. We pray for those who work for peace and justice and reconciliation in America and in the world. We pray for those whose voices are ignored and whose lives are held as less valuable. 
We pray for the poor and the lonely. Comfort them and give them your strength. And we pray that you give us peace of mind to know that you are in it all and that when we slip into worry and fear that the words our Lord Jesus Christ taught us to pray would always be on our lips, that we might always be praying these words. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. So friends, it's been a rough couple of weeks in the news, to be sure. Here at Church of the Palms, please know that we've continued to be very cautious on our campus and with one another. And we've continued to be in prayer for you, our congregation. We miss you all so much. It has been of some comfort that we get to see you sometimes on Zoom or uh, masked at Day of Hope. We've taken comfort too in the steadfastness of your giving. Perhaps generosity is most important in times when the news is rough. Because of course, generosity is such an important tool in our expression of love to God and our expression of love to our neighbors. There are a number of ways in which you can give. They are on your screen now. We thank you. Let us continue our worship. Thank you. 
Accept our offering of praise and our offering of ourselves, O God, along with our tithes and contributions towards our mission of loving you and loving neighbor. You have given us life and guidance for living. You have touched us with your spirit. We rejoice in the opportunity to receive and share your word and your love. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, I'd like to invite the kids to come forward to do a little children's moment together. So I have a question for you. What is one of your favorite drinks? When my kids were your age, they loved Gatorade, especially blue and orange. You know, I think they were Gators before they could even spell Gators. But they also loved Capri Suns and they loved apple juice. But there was one thing that they could drink by the gallon. And you know what that was? Milk. Good old-fashioned cow's milk. There was nothing better than a tall glass of cold, fresh milk. And there's nothing worse than a tall glass of sour milk. Have you ever smelled or tasted milk that has gone sour? You know, like it sat out on the counter too long or it's past its expiration date in the refrigerator. Shoo-hoo-wee, it is bad. But think of that image along with this phrase, use it or lose it. And that's what reminds me of our scripture passage today. Jesus tells a story about this big boss who's going on a big trip So he calls three of his workers to them, and he gives them some talents. He gives five to one, two to another, one to the third guy, and he's like, take care of these for me. So he's gone for a long time. He comes back, and he calls them around, and he says, tell me, what have you done with the talents I have given to you? And the first guy's, yes, I doubled them, and now you have 10. And the second guy, yes, I doubled them too, and now you have four. And the third guy did something odd. He did something that a dog would do with a bone. He dug a hole in the ground and he buried it. And he gave the one talent back to the boss. And the boss was so irritated with him that he took that talent from him and he gave it to the first guy. You see, that third worker was on the losing end of use it or lose it. And it makes me think about you and about me and about how God has given us these talents. And God wants us to use these talents, but he doesn't want us to use them just for ourselves. He wants us to use them to give to others. And the more that we give to others, the more the blessings keep coming. So let's remember talents, gifts. Let's remember to use it so we don't lose it. But even better, let's remember to use it to bless someone else. Will you pray with me? Gracious God, you are so good, and you give us so, so much. Help us, Lord, to use all of those good things to bless others. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
Good morning. My name is Andrea Jackson, and I currently serve on session as an elder here at the church. Our first scripture lesson is taken from the gospel according to Matthew, the 25th chapter, verses 14 through 30. Hear the word of God. For it is as if a man, going on a journey, summoned his slaves and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. The one who had received the five talents went off at once and traded with them and made five more talents. In the same way, the one who had the two talents made two more talents. But the one who had received the one talent went off and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. Then the one who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five more talents, saying, Master, you handed over to me five talents. See, I have made five more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And the one with the two talents also came forward, saying, Master, you handed over to me two talents. See, I have made two more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Then the one who had received the one talent came, across, came forward, saying, Master, I knew that you were a harsh man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you did not scatter seed. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But his master replied, You wicked and lazy slave, you knew, did you, that I reap where I did not sow and gather where I did not scatter. Then you ought to have invested my money with the bank, and on my return, I would have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to the one with the ten talents. For to all those who have, more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. As for this worthless slave, throw him into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Our next lesson is from Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 13, verses 8 through 10. Owe no one anything except to love one another, for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Andrea. Before turning to the sermon this morning, just a couple of more things to call to your attention. First, we had a wonderful discussion last Monday on the book by Martin Luther King Jr., Strength to Love, 50 people crowded onto a Zoom call and we broke into, up into small groups for our discussion and many ideas were shared as to how we can move forward in seeking to build bridges of relationship and reconciliation in our community. It was a very fruitful conversation and we're anxious to take more steps, more on that in the weeks to come. I also wanted to make you aware of some changes that will be happening around our campus. Over the next couple of weeks, we will begin the work that we've been planning to do for quite a long time. You may remember that in our Open Palms Extra Mile campaign, to which you most generously subscribe, we included some renovation projects here on the campus, including refurbishing the campus center and, and the kitchen, which has been largely completed, redoing our chapel, the original building on our campus, and also redoing the chancel here in the sanctuary. 
While the work on the chapel has already begun and through a very generous donation of one of our families, the whole building, in fact, will be redone and upgraded and it will be, I'm sure, beautiful. Likewise, here in the sanctuary, we are set to begin renovating our chancel here, which will include centering our choir loft, refinishing this beautiful oak floor, extending the pulpit forward, and changing out all of the chancel pieces, the communion table, the baptismal font, and even the pulpit, which is not actually the original pulpit. The chancel hasn't been touched in over 15 years, so we're looking forward to heightening both its beauty and its utility. In the short term, though, what this means is that our online worship over the next few weeks is going to look a little different. It will still be coming from the sanctuary, but uh, makeshift is probably the most accurate way to describe what you will experience over the next few Sundays. We'll be moving to the corners of the sanctuary to film so that we can continue while construction is happening here on the chancel. But the music will be the same, the prayers will be the same, the preaching will be the same, just sort of temporary settings. So bear with us while we are under a little construction and we trust that you will be pleased when all is done. Once again, we thank you for your patience and your support. Well, we have been carrying on with this sermon series on the spiritual disciplines and have been looking at a variety of the classical spiritual disciplines over the course of the summer, meditation and fasting and prayer and submission and solitude and others. And so today we take a look at the spiritual discipline of simplicity. And so toward that end, let us pray. By your grace and through your mercy, O Lord, we pray that you allow these words to come to point to the word just read and to the word made flesh in Jesus the Christ, where we pray this in his name, amen. It's hard to imagine an American childhood without at some time being given the chance to play the game Monopoly. Monopoly, the fourth most played board game in the history of board games, outdone only by chess, checkers, and backgammon. Played by over a billion people worldwide in over 140 countries. It's hard to escape Monopoly, the game that could last for hours while you roll your dice, travel around the board, land on properties for sale or for rent, railroads over which to be tycoons, utilities to manage, go to pass by, and jail in which to land. Not to mention chance and community chess cards to draw. Monopoly, where everybody starts with the same amount of money, and the whole point of the game is to acquire and amass and drive all the other players into bankruptcy. I'm afraid to think of how many hours of my childhood were spent around the Monopoly board, moving my little Scotty dog around, that was my favorite piece, buying up properties and houses and waiting with great anticipation for my poor playing companions to land on my boardwalk hotel. It's an interesting thing what a game like this will do to you. A little Darwinian, I suppose, survival of the fittest or the luckiest. Of course, it's only Monopoly money, we say. But interesting what a little Monopoly money will do to you. So it's even more interesting to realize that the game Monopoly originated with a woman named Lizzie McGee back at the turn of the 20th century who in seeing the ascent of tycoons like John D. Rockefeller and Andrew Carnegie and J.P. Morgan was concerned about the effect of unbridled capitalism that would have upon civilization. So she worked on creating a board game that would acquaint people with what an anti-monopoly economy would look like. The original Monopoly game actually was to show people what might happen when wealth, instead of being amassed, was instead shared. The goal of the game was in finding the most creative way of sharing your riches. It was called the Landlord's Game. Now, as it turns out, Lizzie McGee decided to create also a second set of rules for the game that had the opposite goal in mind, the goal that we're used to, acquire and amass. Buy, build, and keep the money for yourself. One game, but two sets of rules. Acquire and amass, monopoly, or acquire and give away, anti-monopoly. Long story short, it wasn't long before people grew more and more interested in the 
monopoly set of rules, the acquire and amass set of rules. They, they like the idea of winners and losers, acquire and amass the bigger, the better. I mean, really, how fun is a game when everybody wins? And then came along John Darrow during the Depression, who took Lizzie's patented idea and without permission turned it into the board game we know today and sold it to Parker Brothers and became himself a millionaire, Mr. Tycoon himself. Lizzie McGee, on the other hand, died a few, later, a few years later in relative obscurity. Truth is often stranger than fiction. Now, I tend to be a basic proponent of democratic capitalism. There are many merits to the system in which we live in America, and one of them is that it leaves us free to choose by what particular rules we will play the game. Free to determine what our ultimate goal is. Free to wrestle with the temptation to make the game strictly about more. Because, because that's how we are wired, right? We're wired as human beings to think that more is good. More is better. Two is better than one. Four is better than two. Better to own the hotel and charge rent than to have to rent the hotel. Better boardwalk than Baltic Avenue. We all play this game of more in one way or the other. It's one of the byproducts of living in this economic system. It's one of the things my daddy taught me early, you know, save your penny, son, compounding interest is the name of the game. And that gets drilled in your head long enough that you think that it really is the only way to play the game. It's the only set of rules for the board. And so as a result, we have storage units up and down B Ridge Road. We have financial advisors. We have closets jammed with stuff we don't even know is there. And we have collectibles whose only purpose is that we have collected them. And we have more and more and more because that's the only set of rules we think there is for the board. We fill our cupboards, our calendars, our coffers and life gets complicated and full and stressed and oversubscribed because we think the name of the game is more and more and more. And you might even wonder if Jesus sees it the same way when you read this parable that we just read, the parable of the three servants who are given differing amounts of money from the landowner and the five talent servant gets, takes his five talents, shrewdly invests them and gets five talents more. The two talent servant invests his two talents and does that wisely and gets two talents more. And the one talent servant buries his cash in the field. Now there's something in me that kind of likes the one talent guy, he's cautious, he's not gonna lose his money in some pandemic crash. He's gonna keep at least what he's got. But surprise, the heroes in Jesus' story are the guys who take the risk and acquire more, more and more. The master says, well done, good and faithful servants, I've given you a little, now you've got more. Maybe that's it. Life's about more and more and more. And it is, Jesus says. It really is about more. Except that the currency is different. Look, Jesus says, look, look more closely at the currency, the coinage, the bills of the board. Because of course, Jesus isn't here to teach us the old game. Jesus is here to teach us the new game. Jesus is here to, stand, to hand out a new set of rules, and the new set of rules starts with the legal tender, the currency of the kingdom, and the currency of the kingdom turns out to be the, the lira of love. You play the game with the coinage of the kingdom, and the coinage of the kingdom is the currency of love. You see how that changes the game. When the currency of the game is love, when the exchange of the game is the coinage of compassion, when the barter of the game is acts of kindness, then the whole game changes. And, and now it's not all about consuming and collecting and closeting. It's all about spending. That's the point that Jesus tries to make in the story. It's about what you're spending. It's about what you're investing. And it's not about what you're keeping. It's about emptying yourself so that others can be full, depositing in other accounts. 
and watching the return. Different game, different stakes. And the great spiritual giants throughout the course of Christ Christian history called us to the discipline of simplicity. It was always with this game in mind. When the early church gathered and held everything in common, it was with this game in mind. When the biblical communities met in places like Corinth and Philippi and Ephesus, it was for the purposes of finding out how they could care for one another. There was, Luke says, there was not a needy person among them. Oh, no one, anything, writes Paul, except to love one another, for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the one who loves another has, has played by the new rules of the game, has spent the currency. When love is the currency, then all the other currencies convert into the lira of love. Where when love is the game you're playing, it changes all the other games. Like the story of the two farmers, Henry and Ralph, and Henry gets invited to a conference on stewardship. And after the conference is over, he comes back, runs into his farmer friend, Ralph, who asks him where he's been. Oh, I went to a, a church conference on stewardship, replies Henry. Stewardship, says Ralph. What'd they tell you about stewardship? Well, Henry says, they said that stewardship goes something like this. Say, for example, you're, you, Ralph, had two houses, and you knew I didn't have a house. Would you give me one of yours? Well, well, sure, replies Ralph. I, if I had two houses, I'd give you one of mine. Well, well let's say you had two tractors, and, and you knew that I needed a tractor. Would you give me one? Well, well sure, says Ralph. If I had two tractors, I'd give you one of my tractors. And, and let's say you had two hogs and you knew that I didn't have any hogs and needed one. Would you, would you give me one of your hogs? Now, come on, Henry. Now, that's not fair. You know I've got two hogs. The game that changes all the other games. Makes me think of Janet Lures. Janet Lures is the editor and publisher of a journal and blog and website called Simple Living. And she tells of when she was 30 years old and had sort of a midlife crisis. She was afraid that she hadn't done enough in her life, so she went to school, she got married, she started a law practice, had two children, bought a four-bedroom house with a great big mortgage, filled it with all sorts of things, charged most of it onto her credit cards. My life was about getting more and more and more. If I wanted it, I got it, and all this was even before Amazon. But as her debts began to grow and her self-esteem continued to diminish, she grew more and more dissatisfied with her life. And she remembers a day when she was looking out the window into the backyard and she saw her children playing with these big rocks. And they were just rolling the rocks around the ground. And that's all they were doing. But they were having the greatest time rolling rocks on the ground. And, and she said to herself, my my children don't need fancy things to entertain themselves. Why do I? So that day she cut up all her credit cards, planned her first rummage sale, sold her new fancy car, bought up a beat up station wagon for $2,500, got rid of all her exercise apparatuses and started running the stairs of a nearby amphitheater. For entertainment, she reads books from the library and hosts potluck dinners. She calls it Voluntary simplicity, living simply with a passion and a purpose. I don't know, that sounds like gospel to me. It sounds like playing the game with a new currency. And maybe the currency that we have today, especially in our season of involuntary simplicity, while we are hiding amidst COVID, maybe the currency we have today is just that, love. Because you see, love can do so many things. And, and love doesn't have room for stuff. Love doesn't, doesn't delight in big bank accounts. Love isn't worried about how it protects its investment. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. It's the only currency you can't spend too much of. 
It's the passion and the purpose around which you can shape the rest of your life. In George Eliot's great story, Silas Marner, she tells the story of a man, Silas Marner, whose heart had grown cold from a series of hard knocks and so sets his life to making money through weaving and in turn becomes this old, miserly, wealthy, lonely, and embittered man who sits in his house with his big bag of gold coins protecting himself and his treasure from anyone who might come and steal it. And sure enough, somebody comes and steals it. And now he has nothing. And every day he opens the door of his house and he stares into the outside through his blurry eyes, hoping beyond hope that maybe somebody, somebody will come and bring his money back. And one day as he's standing his door, out his door staring in a most despondent trance, a little child that has earlier been abandoned makes her way unbeknownst to Silas through the open door behind him and into the house and lays down at the foot of his warm fire. Silas steps back into the house and through his old eyes he sees something before the fire. He can't quite make it out. The gold locks on the girl's head for a moment makes him think his gold has come back. But then Silas realizes it's a little girl and he picks her up, puts her on his lap and holds her and tries to lull her to sleep. Eliot describes it this way, that Silas began to, quote, feel a certain awe in the presence of the little child, such as we feel before some quiet majesty or beauty in the earth or sky, before a steady growing planet or a full flowered sweetbriar or the bending trees over a silent pathway. It can be as simple as that. Now I know the chances are slim that a young child with golden locks is going to crawl into our homes. But I wonder if every day when we turn on the news or scroll through Facebook or Twitter or comb the newspaper, I wonder if every day another person doesn't sort of crawl into our lives. Maybe it's a Jewish neighbor whose synagogue had a swastika sprayed on its walls. Or maybe it's an African-American demanding that black lives matter too. Or maybe it's a working parent who doesn't know what she's going to do when she learns that her child can only be in school two days a week. Or maybe it's a migrant worker in Immokalee just waiting for the COVID to come to him. Or maybe it's a senior trapped in a nursing home. And then we realize the old monopoly doesn't work. The currency has changed. And the only way to win is if everybody wins. All life is interrelated, preached Martin Luther King Jr. in one of the sermons we studied this week. All people are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied into a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. I can never be what I ought to be until you are what you ought to be, and you can never be what you ought to be until I am what I ought to be, King writes. This is the interrelated structure of reality. Or Jesus might say, these are the rules of the new game, a new currency for the new kingdom. Who was it that said, live simply, that others might simply live? Oh, no one anything except to love one another. For the one who loves another is playing the game by the new rules.
of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest and abide with you now and forevermore. Amen. Mm -hmm.